scheduled Friday's news briefing in which Vice President Al Gore and several other cabinet officials announced new federal initiatives against white-collar crime and against criminal activities in federal housing projects. Then at 7.05 a.m. we will show you this week's National Prayer Breakfast, which includes participation from President Clinton and Mother Teresa. At 9 tomorrow morning, it's our live C-SPAN Sunday Journal program. And then at 10.30 tomorrow morning, we'll take a look back at the Republican National Committee birthday tribute for former President Ronald Reagan, which took place here in the nation's capital on Thursday night. And that's some of what's ahead this weekend on C-SPAN. Coming next, it's this week's edition of America and the Courts. This evening, we're going to bring you the proceedings in the Alabama Criminal Court of Appeals. The case involves former Alabama Governor Guy Hunt, who was found guilty in the Montgomery County Circuit Court of using his office for direct personal gain. He brought his appeal of that case last fall to the Alabama Criminal Court of Appeals, and we're now going to show you how this case was argued in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, Governor Hunt was indicted on a charge of using his office to obtain $200,000 for personal gain in violation of the State Ethics Act. He was convicted by a jury in Montgomery County and sentenced, and the motion for new trial was denied. We've assigned several issues, and I will begin by talking about that indictment at this time. First of all, we say that the indictment was too vague. It did not apprise the defendant of the nature of the allegations or the charge with which the grand jury, with the preciseness that the grand jury is required to charge under the law. In Gator v. State, it was a fraud case. They tracked the statute, but the case was reversed because the state did not allege the particular nature in which the alleged fraud was committed. In this case, the Attorney General in the state of Alabama changed its position as legal argument was advanced. Their brief continues to confuse the nature of the charge. For example, when they talk about the statute of limitations, they say we're talking about the personal use of campaign funds. And on page 158 of their brief, they say, in response to an argument, they say that our argument ignores the fact that the political account was still open and existence, and that Hunt could still have used the political funds for a proper purpose. They go on and say no direct personal gain occurred until monies were withdrawn from the political account and used by him personally. There they clearly argue that it's a personal use of excess campaign funds that they're charging. Yet on another page in their brief, page 113, when we argue under the charge and start contesting that, the state says, well, we're not talking about the use of campaign funds at all here. It says none of these counts charged that Hunt use excess campaign funds for personal use, nor did the state claim that these were campaign funds. Through the trial, even in the brief of this honorable court, the Attorney General still does not know its position. How in the world could Governor Hunt or his attorneys decide how to defend this case? We further submit that the uh, and we raised that by motion to dismiss, and it was not granted. We also moved to dismiss on the grounds the indictment did not allege knowingly. Knowingly and willfully is an element of the offense under the Ethics Act. The cases cited, Chandler v. State, Davis, and Harper, all say that you have to allege the essential elements of the offense. Knowingly is one of them. Now, in Chandler, it was raised for the first time on appeal, so they said it would have been error had you raised it in your motion to dismiss. Well, we did raise it in the Hunt motion for dismiss, and it should have been granted. In Harper, they say, well, they alleged unlawful, and the statute says unlawful, but then they go further and also recognize that it was probably a voidable defect, and they only raised it the first time on appeal. We did not. We raised it in the motion to dismiss. It should have been granted. The important thing is the grand jury should have been charged on the law at that time, and if they had thought that Governor Hunt knowingly violated the ethics law, they should have alleged it. They did not. It's reversible error. Regardless of the charge, regardless of the theory, there is no evidence upon which the jury should have even been allowed to consider uh, this matter. First of all, the, 
the evidence indicated that a committee of businessmen who wanted to celebrate the first Republican governor in over 200 years decided they want to raise some money. So the group of businessmen said, well, while we're raising this money to help pay this campaign and sell, uh, this uh, inauguration and to uh, celebrate this event, let's also raise some campaign funds. So these businessmen sat down and hired a lawyer, hired an accountant. The lawyer and accountant came back and they wrote a memo, it's Exhibit uh, 42 uh, for the defendant, Pinckney Memo, and they said, here's how you do it. To, to uh, not violate the Corrupt Practice Act or the Fair Campaign Act or the ethics law, here's what you do. And this group of businessmen set about and tried to do that. They raised some $900,000. $700,000 went into a, a, a nonprofit corporation, and about 200, about really about 140, wound up in the Friends of Guy Hunt political account. When the checks came in, they were made payable to some 27 different entities. This was a fundraiser. People didn't know how to make the check. Some of them paid it to a corporation, some to a friends of Guy Hunt, some to the inauguration committee. The committee members who were in charge of this sat down and divided the money. They're the ones who made the decision that, well, we put this money over here in the nonprofit, we put this money over here in the friends of Guy Hunt. Uh, the plan that the lawyer devised was to, to uh, incorporate a nonprofit corporation so they could use these funds to defray the expense of the inauguration. And at the same time, if any left over, it could go to other purposes, such as help with the mansion and any other charitable purposes that uh, the committee in that uh, corporation saw fit. The governor wasn't on the board of directors. He wasn't a member of that corporation. He wasn't a member of the committee. He was not there when the money came in. The evidence is undisputed that he played no part in dividing these funds. More importantly, the lawyer said, don't commingle these funds. said, make your corporate checks payable to the corporation, make your personal checks payable and divided into the Friends of Guy Hunt account. Bob Fry, who was an ex-FBI agent, testified to the state of Alabama that not one cent of the money, not one cent of the money that went into this charitable fund or this nonprofit corporation went into Governor Hunt's personal account or his political account. Not one cent. We further submit that Governor Hunt wasn't even a public official as the law requires. In 1986, he was governor-elect, uh, but really wasn't even sworn in until January of 1987 when most of the funds had already been raised. Hunt uh, was asked if he'd like to raise money. Sure, how much? About a million and a half. Uh, well, uh, uh, then he was also asked whether or not uh, they, oh, I know what he was asked, whether or not they could use his name to send a letter out, and they did. That's the only two things, only two pieces of evidence that even connected Governor Hunt's name uh, to this entire indictment. There's simply no evidence. The indictment, the motion for acquittal at the end of the evidence should have been granted on the insufficiency of the evidence. Y'all, I want to turn your attention right now to the statute of limitations. Again, it depends on which argument the government makes as to which theory they want you to believe. But we will show you and demonstrate to you, as we have in our brief, that under either theory, the statute of limitations had expired before the return <coughs> of this indictment. It's undisputed that the statute is three years. The indictment was returned on December 28, 1992. Let's take the diversion theory. They say, well, we're not talking about use of campaign funds. We're talking about this money being diverted. Well, if it were destined for charity, and if it were somehow improperly diverted, then it was done in 86 and 87. All of that money had been deposited in these accounts by the spring of 1987. So clearly under the statute, if the theory was diversion, then the statute began to run in spring of 87 and was completely told in the spring of 1990. Now, if, on the other hand, you argue, well, this is a uh, ethics charge and it, it required personal use, and we're talking about the use of the campaign funds, then it expired on November 12, 1988. And how do we reach that? One of the witnesses called by the state was Pat Clark. He was the uh, manager of the Coleman Savings and Loan. The Friends of Guy Hunt had set up two reserve accounts, First Federal and Coleman Savings and Loan. There's no issue about the expenditure of First Federal. But on Coleman Savings and Loan was a Friends, a political account. And the Attorney General argues that as long as it was in that political account, it was somehow okay, and the statute wasn't running. 
The undisputed evidence was that that account changed on November the 12th, 1988, into from a friend's account into Guy Hunt. He was asking whose name is that account, Guy Hunt or Ms. Helen Hunt. Then, it's, then I asked, it was changed to Guy or Helen Hunt on November the 12th? Yes, what year? 1988. Then I asked him again, on November 12th, 1988, did the funds in that account endure to the benefit of Guy Hunt? Yes. So November 12th, 1988, I said, well, who became the owner of that account on that day? He said, Guy Hunt. Then I asked him again, who became owner of everything in that account on November 12th, 1988? Guy Hunt. And then we introduced the 1099 to show the interest charge to Guy Hunt individually that year. The computer printout showed it was in his name. Again, we submit that if somehow or another we're talking about the improper use of campaign funds and the statute uh, began to run on November 12, 1988, the indictment should have been returned November 12, 1991. So whether you're talking about diversion or whether you're talking about the uh, use of campaign funds, the statute of limitations had run. The Attorney General completely ignores the Holden and the Allen case, which is, which is an ethics case, and two or three ethics opinions, which say that it is the exercise of control. It is the uh, receipt. It is the uh, uh, obtaining of, it's the conflict. It's the use of your office in a position in which you direct a financial gain to yourself. And if that occurred in this case, it had to have occurred either in February of 87 or in November of 1988. In fact, the state argues the dissent in Allen. In that case, the judge the, on the Supreme Court dissented and argued that it was uh, uh, not when the corporation of Ms. Allen's, which she controlled, got the money. He was arguing, well, it's later when she gets it in the form of a dividend, because she may never realize any gain out of that. And the uh, Supreme Court said a jury could see through the corporate uh, machinery and draw inference that the defendant's association was for the sole purpose of promoting the corporate endeavors, all of which would ultimately rebound to personal gain on their part. So they didn't say you wait until you spend the money, as the Attorney General suggests. It's when you have that conflict that results in gain to you. And the other cases hold that out too. Uh, the definition of obtain under our criminal code says in relation to property and money we're talking about is to bring about a transfer or purported transfer of a legally recognized interest in the property, whether to the obtainer or to another. So again, if you're talking about diverting funds to a campaign account, to a, that's another, and that would have happened in, in February of 1987. If you're talking about to yourself, it would have been when you exercised control over that bank account, your signature, you can take it out. And that was November of 1988. So under any theory, on the definition of the statute and of the cases, we can clearly see that we're, the statute of limitations of three years had run. We raised that. Uh, uh, at minimum, it should have been thrown out. Uh, it should have also maybe been gone, gone to the jury. The cases we submitted in our brief that if the judge is not convinced as a matter of law that statute is run, he ought to at least submit it to, to the jury for their determination. He did not do that. We assigned that as error. I want to talk a little bit. Uh, yes, ruled, sir. He ruled as a matter of law that the statute of limitations had not run. Yes, sir. And the question was never submitted to the jury. That's correct. We did ask for a written jury charge that if you disagree with us, Judge, would you at least let the jury answer that? And he refused. We've assigned that as error also. I want to talk briefly about the jury charge that was given in this case, which we feel is prejudicial error. It was error for two reasons. One is that it's just not a correct statement of law, and on the cases cited in our brief, the, the giving of an erroneous charge as prejudicial, as it was in this case, requires reversal. Second, we say that the giving of the charge uh, amounts to an ex post facto law. And of course, the theory of ex post facto is that no person should be punished without being given advance notice that what he was doing was criminal. In our case, we have uh, Alabama cases that have reached that same decision, ex parte Alexander. In that case, the court enlarged the definition of escape. And they said, that's fine, but you have to apply it prospectively only. You can't apply it to the facts of this case because that man had no advance notice. State v. Longino was a Mississippi case in uh, which the court reached a similar result in a bank fraud case. The facts 
that the uh, that constituted the uh, crime was held by a judge or, or the fact that constituted the offense was held to be a crime by the judge, and they said, well, it hadn't been before, and therefore you can only make this prospective in application. Uh, what was the attitude? What was the law? What was the feeling about everybody concerned with this case at the time this went to trial concerning the use of those funds? First, let me talk to you about the charge. The court charged over our objection. That the Alabama ethics law provides that no public official should, shall use an official position or office to obtain direct personal financial gain. That was all right to that point. And then he says, unless such use and gain are specifically authorized by law, and he charged them that the use of excess campaign funds for direct personal financial gains is therefore not a lawful purpose, as that phrase is used in the Fair Campaign Practices Act. And he was saying that under the ethics law, you cannot use excess campaign funds for personal use. Well, what was the opinion before that time? First, let's see what the judge thought. We had about a week of pretrial hearings. That's in the transcript. And on several occasions, we would talk about what theory the Turner Jail was going on and what was wrong with using personal, personal funds. And the judge, on page 114, he's quoted the brief. It's the record 3475. He says, my understanding of law is, and I'm not sure what that law is, but my understanding is, if it's a political fund, you can pay off campaign debts. You can buy Cadillacs. You can do whatever you want to. Then he says, if the funds were political, they could be used for personal use. This was the judge's instructions to us, his understanding of the law at that time. One of the most egregious errors in this whole case is that Governor Hunt was denied a public trial as guaranteed by our state and federal constitutions. This, the, the cases, this, the Supreme Court and this court in interpreting the rights of the media have held that Judge Thomas abused his discretion and that he should not have closed these hearings. It's not just the trial with a jury, it's all proceedings. Our criminal rules of criminal uh, procedure say all proceedings shall be open to the public. Here we have a situation where a trial court is telling us the law, his feelings on the law, what he thinks the law is. And then we go in and make open statements. We go in and call witnesses. We cross-examine the state's witnesses based on what we perceive the law to be as the judge perceives it. And then 180 degree reversal, he says, oh, I've changed my mind. It is a violation of the law. That is not fair. And had we had a public trial, had we had everything open to the public, I don't think he would have reached that same conclusion, and we wouldn't have that problem today. It was prejudicial, very prejudicial on his part. But you know, he wasn't the only player. For some reason, the Attorney General sought to call Mr. Cooper, who was Executive Director of the Alabama Ethics uh, Commission. I asked him, now isn't it true that you know of no current reason why a public official can't use excess campaign funds for personal use? And here's his answer on page R36, 759 and 760. To the very best of my knowledge, and based on opinions from the Office of the Attorney General, there is nothing to preclude a candidate, neither challenger or incumbent, that's a public official, from converting campaign funds to personal use. And he was basing that not only on his personal experience, but opinions from the very office that was prosecuting the governor, the Attorney General. Not just one opinion, as we read in evidence and as cited in our brief, but the Attorney General had written several opinions, and he had followed those opinions, and he knew no reason. So he, the legislature filed a lawsuit after this, wanting to declare the rights, and then finally amended the law, which we've cited in our brief, to make, it, make the personal use now of campaign funds uh, a violation of the Fair Campaign Practice Act. But until that time, it had not been declared, and if this court wants that to be the law, it ought to be applied prospectively, not retroactively, not against Governor Hunt. <laughs> As the court has said in uh, Rebus v. United States, any ambiguity in a criminal statute should be resolved in favor of leniency. We were hoping the Attorney General would address that in his reply brief so we could respond, but the Attorney General chose not to. They did not respond to our issue on ex post facto. They said we didn't raise it in our motion to dismiss. Well, it didn't come up until the trial was over, until the, until the uh, uh, charge was given, so we had no choice. We objected to the charge on that ground. We objected to it on motion for new trial. Uh, so we preserved the error, and I was hoping he would address that argument. But it does not 
Uh, but it does appear in this case to have punished someone uh, for conduct for which they were given no advance notice that the conduct was criminal. I want to turn now and talk briefly about venue. I hope this issue doesn't even have to be reached because of the other argument and other issues we've raised. But in the event it is, we would argue that the trial court committed error by not transferring the case to Coleman County, Alabama. The Ethics Act contains a very precise pronouncement of the legislature's intent, and that is that any public official that is charged with the violation of that Ethics Act be tried in the county of their residence. The Attorney General responds by saying that the Constitution requires the governor to reside in Montgomery, therefore his residence in Mon is in Montgomery. The Constitution is supreme, we realize that, and a statute can't overrule it. But we have to look beyond reside. We, we beg the question by saying the Constitution requires him to reside there. We have to go further and see how these courts, this court and the Supreme Court and other courts have interpreted and construed what is meant by reside. For venue purposes, these courts have always construed residing to mean domicile. And they are very clear that there's a difference between where a person is domiciled, where he votes, where he owns property, where he intends to return, as opposed to where he physically resides. A person can have more than one residence. He can have multiple residences. He can be required to live in Montgomery, uh, but not have a domicile in Montgomery. There's a state statute that says no public official gives up his domicile. You don't gain or lose because you serve uh, the public. And in this case, the application of the, uh, or rather the requirement of trial be in Montgomery uh, violates that statute. Also violates the Ethics Act. The domicile requirement uh, goes way back. There's a case, uh, in a divorce case, where a man, because of his job, had to leave, uh, move from his domicile and live in another county, ex parte Stroud. And the issue of residence came up there, or venue, and they said, well, we're talking about domicile when we talk about venue. And uh, just because a man lives over here to go to work, more convenient or whatever, or acquired to by his job, does not mean that he has intentionally left that area, or that he does not intend. You look to the intent to remain permanently. Governor Hunt filed an affidavit, it was uncontroversial, that he he votes in Coleman County, he has property there, he farms there, he preaches there, he votes there, he intends to return there when his public service is up. So just like he, just like a judge, just like a legislator or any other public official, there's a state statute that requires every public official to live in or near Montgomery. It doesn't say you have to be domiciled here. It doesn't say under the Ethics Act that you could not uh, have your trial in the county of your residence, which has been interpreted to mean the county of your domicile. But so for those reasons, the court committed error and it should have been tried in Coburn County and not Montgomery County. We've also assigned, Your Honor, the prejudicial adverse publicity. Uh, I won't take time to argue that now. There are some other issues I want to mention. Uh, but we submit that the trial judge abused his discretion by not transferring the case out of Montgomery County because of the numerous adverse publicity or, or many adverse publicity that was there. Finally, I want to argue before I sit down the accumulative error, and I'm just going to hit the high points of these. But we, we assign his error, the misconduct of the Attorney General in singling out Governor Hunt for prosecution, for browbeating a witness uh, uh, unmercifully and repeatedly, for throwing out exclamatory remarks such as Daddy War Bucks and Mercedes Benz and things that in an ordinary, ordinary case would uh, warrant reversal laying the problems with Alabama's educational system at his feet. The ex parte contact by the court and uh, talking to the head of the Ethics Commission who referred this case initially uh, for prosecution is just something that the public should not, cannot understand and should not have to understand. And of course, subpoenaing Governor Hunt's trial at attorney at the time, making him bring boxes of documents to the grand jury violates his Sixth Amendment right. And we submit that there was jury contact here the sequestration rule was not followed, and there's a presumption of prejudice that the state never even attempted to overcome. We believe for the 
errors I've argued, for those that I've hastily gone over, and for others assigned in the brief, that this case should be reversed and rendered. Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Rosa Davis. I'm a Deputy Attorney General for the State of Alabama, and I'm Chief of the Criminal Appeals Division in the Attorney General's Office. And I represent the State of Alabama in this matter. It is an honor and a privilege for me to be here before this court today on this particular matter. This matter represents ethics in government. It represents not using your office for direct personal financial gain. As the court stated in Rampey, in the Rampey case, which is cited in our brief, this case is about prohibiting public officials from using their office to reap private benefit, which is what happened in this case. One thing I want to make abundantly clear before we get started, and I think it was clear to us from beginning to end, and should have been clear to the defendant and to the defense attorney, this case is not about campaign funds. This case is about money raised for a private, nonprofit corporation. The only reason we ever talk about campaign funds is the defense's defense to this case. That defense was, it's okay, it was campaign money, and I used it to pay off old debts. So I was entitled to this money. That's not what this case is about. Let me tell you what this case is about. This case is about the formation of a nonprofit corporation for the purpose of raising money for paying for the transition and inauguration of this first Republican governor since Reconstruction. As the appellant pointed out in oral argument, people were excited. They wanted to have a big celebration. And they, it was decided that the celebration would pay for itself. There are three main players throughout the facts in this case that you have to observe. Those players are Harold Guy Hunt, who is the, the, the defendant and the governor-elect of the state of Alabama and the governor of the state of Alabama at all times relevant to this case. At all times relevant to this case. The other players that are important that you have to keep your eye on are Edna Earl Hicks and Rosie Blocker. Who are they? They're two old friends of Governor Guy Hunt. They came to Montgomery, Alabama from Coleman with him. They were appointed to the transition team and put on the state payroll very shortly after Guy Hunt was elected governor of the state of Alabama. These two players had been with Guy Hunt for at least 25 years. Edna Earl Hicks, after Guy Hunt was sworn into office, became the confidential assistant to the governor. Rosie Blocker became an executive assistant to the governor, continuing on the state payroll after the transition. Now let's look at what happened in this case. There is a chart in our brief, Exhibit A4, which was introduced into evidence in the case as Exhibit 15, which shows you what happened with bank accounts. One thing I want to point out to you about that chart at the very beginning, there are two extremely important bank accounts that weren't really used in this case. The first one is at the top of the page. It was opened in June 1985 and closed in September of 1987. Testimony in this case is that's the 1986 campaign account of Harold Guy Hunt. That's the campaign money. $1,485,931.33 was put into that account to elect Guy Hunt governor. Then at the bottom of the page, there is another chart, another line, which is also a legitimate campaign account. That account was opened at First Alabama Bank in September of 1987 and closed in December of 1991. That was the 1990 campaign account of Harold Guy Hunt. Now there are numerous other bank accounts involved in this case and we're going to talk about them as the facts develop. 
Let's talk about the facts. On no in November of 1986, Guy Hunt was elected governor. The idea was formed to raise the money. On November the 26th, and, and Rosie Blocker and Edna Hicks were put on the state payroll, his old friends, on the transition team. In November of 1986, a bank account was opened at Union Bank and Trust Company called the 1987 Inaugural Committee Account. That account was later changed to become the Hunt Transition and Inaugural Fund account. That's one account, November 26, 1986. The signatories on that account, Edgar Weldon, Robin Swift, and Judy Pittman, two well-known Republicans and the main employee of the Hunt Transition and Inaugural Fund, which was later created. That's the legitimate 1987 Inaugural Committee Hunt Transition and Inaugural Fund account. In December, a private nonprofit corporation was formed for purposes of raising money for the transition and inauguration. It had as its, uh, some very laudable purposes. One, to effect an orderly transition. Two, to pay for at least part of the cost, if not all the cost of the transition. To renovate the governor's mansion. To assist the governor and his staff in promoting the welfare of the people of the state of Alabama. That's where the inaugural money was supposed to go. It also had as one of its purpose the promotion or carrying out of other signs of a general uh, list of things it could do to carry out other scientific, civic, patriotic, and even political purposes. And when I say political purposes, you've got to look a little further. Because also in the articles of incorporation of that nonprofit, private nonprofit corporation, was an exclusion that said. No funds of this corporation can be used in any election or nomination to promote the election or nomination of ind any individual. That's what campaign money is for. Nor could it be used to promote any item that might appear on the ballot for the vote of the people. So when you could use it for political, political things, promoting the election of a candidate was not one of them. On the, the bank account name was changed to the Hunt Transition and Inaugural Fund. On December 17, 1986, a mailgram went out. The mailgram was from Guy Hunt, governor elect. That's how he was identified on the mailgram. It was to the Inaugural Finance Committee. What did that say? This is from people who got it. Say, Guy Hunt is calling on me. It said, I'm using this means to reach you quickly because we need some money quickly. We're going to pay for the inauguration and transition. We're not going to cost the taxpayers any money. All the expenses are going to be paid by money you raise. My chairman, Jim Wilson, will get in touch with you in a few days. And he will detail to you how this is going to be done. And when Helen, and I'm only asking trusted and valued friends to help me raise this money for the inauguration. He also says, when Helen and I get settled in the governor's mansion, this is important, when we get settled in the governor's mansion, all finance committee members who meet their goal, we're talking about use of office here, all finance members who meet their goal will be invited to a reception at the governor's mansion and I will also invite members of my cabinet and introduce you to them. You get a special end to the governor. You get a special end to the governor. You get to meet the governor's cabinet, if you meet your governor. On December the 21st, and this was money to be raised for the Hunt Transition and Inauguration. Nobody said anything about campaign money. On December the 21st, the follow-up letter from Jim Wilson was sent out. That letter said, all expenses of the inauguration and cost of the transition will be paid by the Hunt Transition and Inaugural Fund Incorporated. A special account will be set up for that purpose. Proceeds for the sale of tickets, for advertising, and other contributions will go into that account. Nothing is said about campaign money. Nothing. 
The letter said, how can you help? To meet your goal, you gotta sell or buy $5,000 ticket package and $5,000 in advertising. If you do those two things, remember, you get to go meet at the mansion with the governor after he and Helen have moved in. You also, it's, it, this letter set out how much the tickets were, how much had to be paid. The letter said nothing about campaign money. You had to buy the $5,000 ticket package. If you bought the $5,000 ticket package, the letter said, you can sit on the stands at the inauguration when Guy Hunt takes his oath of office. When he does the act that makes him governor of the state of Alabama, the act that belongs to the people of the state of Alabama, if you pay your money to the transition inaugural fund, you can sit up close so he can see that you're there. Didn't say so he could see that you're there. He said you can, you've got to sit on reserve seating for that event. The rest of it is in. The corporate, it, the letter went on to say, corporate checks for advertising should be made out to the Hunt Transition and Inaugural Fund Incorporated. Personal checks should be made out, for tickets should be made out to the 1987 Inaugural Committee. Two ways they told them to make out checks to the inaugural fund and the 1987 inaugural committee. Those were both the same bank account. Same bank account. It was the only existing bank account for the inauguration at that point in time. Then the first step in the diversion process begins. On January the 8th, 1987, a second account is opened at Union Bank and Trust Company. The second count has as signatories on it, Rosie Blocker and Edna Hicks, the governor's friends from Coleman, who are serving on the transition team, who become his confidential and executive assistants. And that account is entitled Friends of Guy Hunt. <clears throat> that account doesn't say anything about any inauguration. The name of it is Friends of Guy Hunt. The money came in, $1.1 million was raised. 720,000 of, of that money went into the Hunt Transition Inaugural Fund Incorporated. 390,000 went into the Union Bank and Trust Company, Friends of Guy Hunt. Remember, both of those accounts are at Union Bank and Trust Company. All of the checks were similar. The only difference was who made them out, whether they were corporations or private individuals. Both accounts had checks made out to the Hunt Transition and Inaugural Fund Incorporated. Both accounts had checks made out to the 1987 Inaugural Committee. Both accounts had in it checks made out to the uh, Hunt Inauguration, the Hunt Transition, all these different variations. Both accounts had all those checks on them. But the interesting thing that happened to the money and the checks that went into the, night, into the Friends of Guy Hunt account at Union Bank and Trust Company was this. Out of the first three deposits, the batches of checks were endorsed on the back with a stamp. And the stamp said, 1987 Inaugural Committee, for deposit only, 1987 Inaugural Committee, account number 1205175. Then someone took a pen and marked through the account number and put a new account number on there. And the new account number was the account number at Union Bank and Trust Company for the Friends of Guy Hunt account. And those checks with the altered deposits were put into the Friends of Guy Hunt account. That happened in three batches of deposits. People got the checks back. Who did they think got the money? The 1987 Inaugural Committee. The Hunt Transition Inaugural Fund. After those first three batches of deposits, the checks were endorsed on the back with no name, just for deposit only an account number. People who got the checks back still didn't know they went into Friends of Guy Hunt. There's no way they could know that. It's also interesting to note that in the Friends of Guy Hunt account, there went 10, 000, about $10,000 in checks actually made out to Friends of Guy Hunt. 
Edna Hicks wrote one of those checks. She knew how to make out a campaign check. And she put it into that account. This is the governor's close friend, his soon-to-be confidential assistant. Let me ask you a question now. The uh, $309,000 that went into that account, uh, are you saying that all of that should have gone into the into the corporate account every, except, except that $10,000? Every penny except that $3,000 should have gone into the corporate account. And that, that's your position on that? Uh, the, it, the money was raised for that purpose. And it should have gone into that account. Mr. Fry said something in his testimony that thought that those funds were commingled. What, what did he mean by that? Do you know? Do you remember that? The funds were commingled as they were raised. The funds were commingled as they were raised. You mean between they those two accounts? No. No. It is true that no money went out of the friends of, from the Hunt Transition and Novel Fund account into the Friends of Guy Hunt account. As far as we know, that didn't happen. The diversion was before they put the money in the account. The commingling was the raising of the money and bringing it in. That's where the commingling occurred. But there were no, uh, at this point, no transfers back and forth. Thus far, what we have seen is that Harold Guy Hunt used his office in the raising of this money. He used his office when the mailgram went out over Guy, the name of Guy Hunt, Governor-elect. He used his office when the mailroom was used. There's testimony in this case. The mailroom was used to send out invitations. <coughs> he used his office when Edna and Rosie went on the state payroll and participated in all of these events. He used his office when he sold tickets to a swearing in an event that belonged to the people of the state of Alabama, an event that only occurred because he had been elected governor. He used his office when he invited people who meet their goals to come to the mansion to rub elbows with his cabinet members. He used his office when the Young, young Alabamians Ball was held at the Coliseum free of charge. The evidence was because he was governor of the state of Alabama. He used his office the day after he was sworn in, when he appointed as confidential assistant Edna Hicks and his executive assistant Rosie Block. And he used his office in March, on March 6th, 1987, when he authorized the payment of the solicitations out of the governor's contingency fund. State employees were used to send all this material out and then, the defendant in this case authorized the payment for that out of the governor's contingency fund, a fund appropriated by the legislature of the state of Alabama for the use of the governor of the state. We do recognize that that money that was paid out of the contingency fund was later paid back. But we point out the use of the office was in paying that bill in the first place. He used his office. Let's move on to guilty knowledge. Some of the same things show guilty knowledge. The mailgram, the opening of the new account at uh, Union Bank and Trust Company by his two good friends. Uh, why didn't he use the old campaign account? We already told you it existed. Or a new campaign account that would be used in the 1990 election. Guilty knowledge also comes from the Pinckney memo. The memo that the defense says told them this whole scheme was all right. Read the memo. We didn't attach it as an exhibit to our brief. It was introduced as an exhibit at trial, and it's probably, uh, uh, I don't know whether it's been brought up to this court yet or not, but this court needs to read that memo, and I'll be happy to supply you with a copy of it. The memo asked two questions. John Grignier on, asked two questions, which are answered in the memo on November 14, 1986 within two weeks, less than two weeks, of the election of Guy Hunt as governor of the Dallas state of Alabama. The memo asked, can you use excess campaign funds for personal use? Pinckney addresses that issue as to the campaign funds reposing in the campaign depositories at that time. That's money, he doesn't say this. 
But that's money raised prior to the election of Guy Holmes as governor. And he says, yes, you can. Because that, and then he, on, later he talks about use of office for personal gain. It becomes obvious that he's saying, yes, you can. Because you didn't use your office to raise that money. Then it addresses the issue, and that, that's pre-election money. Then it raises the issue of, can we raise this money for the inauguration? And what does Pinckney tell him? He says, yes, you can, but beware of 3625.5, which says the, you can't, a public official can't use his office to obtain direct personal financial gain. He warns him, you got a problem there. And he says, you don't have a problem raising this money because none of it will inure to the private benefit or personal gain of a public official. It's for the corporation. It won't go into the pocket of Guy Hunter. Therefore, it's okay to raise this inaugural money. What the ethics law prohibits is raising money, using your office, and turning that money into direct personal financial gain. <coughs> it doesn't prohibit raising money under 3625.5. does under some other sections, but not under 3625.5. But also note at this point, there was a lot of talk about when Guy Hunt became a public official. There was an amendment to the ethics law in 1986. And the amendment to the ethics law in 1986 changed the definition of public official. Changed the definition of public official from an official who is elected. In other words, it included official in the old definition. To a person who is elected to state office. When is a person elected? Guy Hunt was elected in November of 1986. At that point, under the ethics law, he became a public official. What happened to the money? What happened to the money? That's where we really found out about guilty knowledge. This money didn't go Directly, it didn't go into any old campaign accounts. The 390,000 in the new, what we call the fake campaign account, Union Bank and Trust. The money was then laundered through various accounts. Never went directly anywhere. On February the 12th, after he was sworn into office, two state employees, Edna Hicks and Rosie Blocker, who were the signatories on the U Union Bank and Trust Company Friends of Guy Hunt account, made out, executed three checks for $100,000 each. Those checks were executed to Friends of Guy Hunt. The checks were taken to Coleman, Alabama. If you look down on the chart on, at the bottom of the page, the big wide line through the me middle of the page is Guy Hunt's personal AmSouth account. The, um, Account, two accounts under that are two of the accounts into which the $100,000 checks went. The other account is the Guy Hunt Reserve account, which is the middle account at the top of the page. One $100,000 check went into a new Friends of Guy Hunt account at AmSouth Bank. It did not go into the Friends of Guy Hunt campaign account real campaign account that had existed there. It went into a new account open for the purpose of depositing this $100,000. The second check went into an account at First Federal Savings and Loan in Coleman, Alabama. That account had on it the name Friends of Guy Hunt, Guy Hunt Reserve. All the checks written out of that account didn't have Friends of Guy Hunt on them. The name on the check was Guy Hunt Reserve. People who received payment out of that account didn't know it was coming from friends of Guy Hunt. Thought it was coming from an account called Guy Hunt Reserve. The third check, Pat Clark testifies, Guy Hunt came in to Coleman Savings and Loan personally and opened two accounts. One named Friends of Guy Hunt. Signatories, Guy Hunt, Rosie Blocker, and Edna Hicks. The other account 
was a personal savings account. Both of these were savings accounts, but the other one was a personal savings account. Guy or Helen Hunt. Two accounts. And the $100,000 went into the Friends of Guy Hunt account. The other account was open with several hundred dollars. Let's talk about the, what happened to the money after it went into those accounts. The easiest one to deal with, because it involves the fewest transactions, is the uh, new AmSouth Friends of Guy Hunt account, where the first, I told you the first 100,000 went. In June of 1987, after there was some $1,700 in interest drawn on this, on this account, the, a, a check for $100,000 was executed by Edna Hicks, and the check went to the 1987 the Hunt Transition and Inaugural Fund account at Union Bank and Trust Company. The inaugural account had run low. Guy Hunt gave $100,000 back. He knew where it went. He knew who it belonged to. The money went back. He spent on personal items the interest that was drawn on that, that, that account generated. The second account was the uh, Guy Hunt Reserve out of which Guy Hunt wrote numerous checks. And these checks, for the most part, were signed by Guy Hunt on checks that showed the account was Guy Hunt Reserve. First check was written in Febu on February 16th of 1987 for $25,000 to Walker Brothers, building, which is a building supply company. Testimony at trial showed that that check was used to pay for residential building supplies wasn't used for any campaign purposes. Other checks were used for items out of that account. Were used for items such as uh, fence post, uh, lawn, a riding lawnmower, more post and wire, uh, manufactured marble shower stall, cattle, building supplies. Uh, three checks went to a secretary and the governor's office in Montgomery to pay her mortgage, I believe in Dothan. Uh, another check went to another young woman in the governor's office. Uh, she testified at one time that it was a gift, and then she testified another time that it was for tires. But I think that, that check was $266. This money went for personal purposes, for the private personal gain of Harold Guy Hunt. The third account the Friends of Guy Hunt account at Am South Bank. The first check out of that account went into his personal Am South savings account, I mean personal Am South checking account. That money was, was a $30,000 check that was used to pay Guy Hunt's 1986, note the year, 1986 income taxes. $30,000 to pay his 1986 income taxes. Other funds out of that account went into his personal account to pay a mortgage at Merchants Bank. The mortgage was on 67 acres of property owned by Guy Hunt. Uh, it, other checks went to uh, one check went to the new real campaign account for the 1990 campaign that was open at First Alabama Bank. That uh, check was for $12,000. It went into a real campaign account. Uh, another check was put into Guy Hunt Reserve, at, out of which he could write checks with the, had nothing on it but Guy Hunt Reserve. This was a savings account. All the checks that came out of this account were cashier's checks. All the checks that came out of this account were cashier's checks. On July the 18th, 1988, another $2,000 went into his personal checking account at AmSouth Bank. January the 3rd, 1989, another check went to his personal account at AmSouth Bank. Some of these checks were used to cover a mortgage. Most of them were used to pay electricity um, and various and sundry personal expenses. Those are all itemized in the brief, and instead of going over them all and wasting the court's time, I won't do that. Much as so, we're talking about knowledge. 
We've already talked about use of office. We're talking about knowledge. Did the governor know what was going on? Who besides Guy Hunt had any interest in knowing whether or not the funds remaining in his uh, 1986 campaign repository immediately after the election could be used for personal use? That clearly ties him to asking the question of people. Who besides Guy Hunt was interested in whether you might be able to raise some personal funds on the inauguration? Because where would those personal funds go? In the pocket of Guy Hunt. Knowledge is shown through Edna and Rosie on the transition team, through the mailgram that sent out from Guy Hunt, Governor-elect. He also, we introduced his ethics statements. He failed to disclose on any of his ethics statements any income from Friends of Guy Hunt or from the 1987 inaugural committee or from the Hunt Transition and Inaugural Fund. These were public documents where anybody could go and look at the documents and see what kind of money, uh, income a public official had. None of it was reported on that. He did report some of it on his income taxes. He personally signed the letter, to the authorization to pay for the mail outs, which was signed out of his office. The, uh, the checks endorsements were altered. Somebody had guilty knowledge of that. Who was in charge of those accounts? Edna and Rosie, his good friends. Guy Hunt knew what was going on. And then the movement of the money. The movement of the money, first into a Friends of Guy Hunt account, then to three different Friends of Guy Hunt accounts where nobody would suspect that this was a novel money. And then on into uh, his personal checking account. The money was covered up. It worked all the way through until he spent the final money in December of 1989. It's clear from the evidence that was presented by the state that the defendant had knowledge that he used his office, and he obtained direct personal financial gain. And the money he obtained as direct personal financial gain came from the 1987 Transition and Inaugural Fund, the Hunt Transition and Inaugural Fund. That's where that money was supposed to go. And that such use and gain are not otherwise authorized by law. Nothing authorizes anybody to steal money from a nonprofit corporation. So at the end of the state's case, the state had clearly proven the violations set out in the indictment. But there were other factors that came into play. During the defense case, uh, in Judy Pittman's testimony, she said she reported to the governor frequently. She said that the governor wanted to raise $1.5 million. She said that uh, she kept him informed of what was going on and that he participated in the amounts to be paid for the tickets. She said there was a memo introduced. And the memo said, I can't exactly quote the words, but the memo said we had, if the, the scam with the finance committee had better work, had damn well better work, because if it doesn't, we're exposed. It was a scam to raise this money to put in his pocket. The defendant complains about the, at the charge that the trial judge gave. And I want to talk about the charge for a little bit. I've run out of time, but there's several things that it's okay with the court. I'd like to. Yeah, I'd, I'd like for you to address the statute of limitations question, too. Okay, I will. Uh, is, you would, could I go on with the charge? Go okay, going on with the jury charge. And what did he do? He told the jury what the law is. He said under the Fair Campaign Practices Act, when you run for office, you set up a political committee. And the political committee sets up a bank account, and all contributions go into that bank account, and all checks are written out of that bank account. Remember all these fake accounts we've had in here. That uh, only $100 in petty cash can be spent otherwise than out of this account. He also told the jury that if you had excess campaign funds, you could use them for certain purposes. You could use them to pay back old campaign debts. You could use them to uh, old or new campaign debts. You could give them to another political committee. You could uh, give them to certain charities. Or you can use them for any other lawful purpose. How does the trial court determine what any other lawful purpose is? The trial court looks to the law. 
just like Pinckney did in his memo when he talked about using office for direct personal financial gain. And he went to 3625.5 of the ethics law, the statute charged with being violated in this case. And in the ethics law, he saw that a public official, and a public official is somebody who's been elected. Guy Hunt was elected every minute of this offense. That somebody who's been elected to a state office can't use his official position to obtain direct personal financial gain. So he told the jury, he told the jury that use of your op that using excess campaign funds for direct personal financial gain was not a lawful purpose under the Fair Cam Campaign Practices Act. He had no choice. It was a clear statement of the clear law. What about use of office in that scenario? All the way through pretrial and trial, the defense kept saying, you can't raise money after you become a public official without using your office. You can't do it. And the Attorney General kept saying, you can't spend it if you raise it that way. You can't spend it if you raise it that way. The quotes that Mr. Beck read to you about this change in uh, the court's perception of the law, it was clear during pre-trial, the court hadn't sat down and read the um, ethics law as it had been amended in 1986. How did he come? And every time he said what he thought the law was, he said, I'm not sure, I think. And the Attorney General says, I don't agree. That happened in each one of those quotes that he read to you. So the trial judge charged the jury correctly on the law. The defense also claims that this is a case of selective prosecution. Nobody else has ever been prosecuted for spending excess campaign funds. But in order to, for that to be uh, a defense, the defense has got to show there was selectivity, that it was intentional, and that it was invidious. Doesn't show any selectivity in this case because it doesn't show but one other person who may probably have violated the law. The defense introduced into evidence all the statement of economic interest, I think 140 they said, none of them showed campaign funds going to personal use. None of them. He introduced both the campaign statements and the financial disclosure statements of the Attorney General and one representative. And when Mr. Cooper, the Ethics Commission director, saw the Attorney General's, it was clean. When he saw the uh, state representatives, he decided, I'll take a look at this. Thank you, Mr. Beck, for bringing it to my attention. Nobody knew about that. Mr. Cooper could not investigate without a complaint being filed. He took this to be a complaint so that he could investigate the issue raised. There was no proffer made, and this is important to entrapment and selective prosecution. No proffer made of the rest of the financial disclosure forms of the elected public officials. I thought there was, the brief says there was, but when, we went, when I went back to the record, when in doubt, read the record, it's not there. So I sent our investigators down to the uh, courthouse. It's not there. Those were not proffered. There was no evidence of selectivity in this case. This case was prosecuted because the grand jury received a referral from the Ethics Commission and had the opportunity to look into uh, this defendant's finances, to subpoena bank records, to see if he got a profit from his airplane trips. And when they did, they found $200,000 that inured to this defendant out of the Hunt Transition and Novel Fund. No selectivity, no entrapment by estoppel. It didn't happen. Let's talk about the entrapment by estoppel just for a sec. There, okay, let's move on to the statute of limitations. The statute of limitations in this case, the defendant claims that it began to run um, at the last event on, 12, on de November the 12th, 1988. We're looking at an ethics case here. I have as the defense suggested, gone back and read Britton, Allen, Rampy, and Chandler. And what you get from reading all those cases, the principle of law, 
is that when you look at 36.25.5, it can be violated in a myriad of different ways. There are as, as many ways as the human mind can imagine uh, can be used by a public official to reap personal financial gain from uh, his office, from the use of his office. But the one thread that runs through all those cases is you have to look at each case on a case-by-case -case basis to see when is the direct personal financial gain. Now, all through pretrial, and I think that's what this court should hold, that you gotta look to the case to determine when direct personal financial gain occurs. And that's what the trial court did in this case. On November the 12th, 1988, the signature cards were changed on the Coleman Savings and Loan account. One signature card was put in place. Two accounts continued to exist. Two ledger sheets continued to be kept. The money continued to be laundered. The defendant continued to put the money in his personal account and spend it. He didn't change how he was doing things. He kept doing it the same way. His whole scheme was to launder the money, to hide it, until it inured directly to his personal bank account, which is where most of this money went. We're going to have to decide what date statute of limitations applies in this case. You've got to decide exactly what date. And, and as I see it, it's, it's either the date that the money went in, that the last transaction went into his personal bank account, or, as you contend, later when he actually spent the money. When did it... Did no, but December the 29th, 1989 is when this money inured totally to the benefit of Harold Guy Hunt. So you were saying that when he got the money in his personal bank account, that still hadn't, hadn't uh, resulted in look, direct financial benefit? No, not if you look at what he'd done with the money, Judge. If you look at what he had done with the money, at that point in the time, it stayed in the same account. He had two accounts at that bank. If he had intended to tell the world that I'm taking this money and using it for my own right here, right now, he could have very easily closed that account and put the money into his personal checking account, into his personal savings account. Remember, he opened both of those accounts on the same day. But remember also that we're getting further and further away from the inauguration, from the use of need for a Friends of Guy Hunt account. He still used the money the same way, the same scheme, he never changed his scheme. When he went in and changed the name on the bank account, he didn't change the scheme. He kept spending the money just like he did. Just like he always had. And that's why we say the statute of limitations began to run on December the 29th, 1989. And if you look at all the ethics cases and you determine what is personal financial gain or direct personal financial gain, you'll find that it's treated differently in almost every case because the scheme is different and the facts are different. This use of office and to obtain direct personal financial gain was a money laundering scheme. And that account regardless of what the name on it was, on November the 12th, 1988, was part of that scheme. And the judge recognized, trial judge recognized that as a matter of law. The defense, all the way through pre-trial, insisted that this question was a matter of law. And the trial judge, seeing the scheme, said you're right. Applying the, sec the cases under 3625.5, said you're right. My time is up. Uh, if there are any other issues the court is particularly interested in, I can go into them. Uh, under, under the state's theory of the case, then the portion of the jury charge dealing 
with campaign bonds, you would consider that mere surplusage. Is that right? Either surplusage or in response to the defendant's defense. And I actually <coughs> take the position then that that particular part of the charge uh, was not confusing to the, to the jury in view of the overall charge. Is that your position? Not in the least. If you read the whole case, it's not in the least confusing. Because if you, when you read the transcript and you look at the evidence, all the way through, the defendant kept trying to make campaign funds an issue. And how did he do that? He did that particularly during his case and in rebuttal. When he comes up and, and he's, he's never calling this money anything but campaign money. Never calls it anything but campaign money. And during his case, he says uh, that the, the introduced into evidence is the 1978 uh, financial disclosure statement of Guy Hunt after he ran unsuccessfully for governor in 1978. That says Guy Hunt owed uh, personal loans to the campaign of $140,000. Moving on to 1983, and that's why, how he tried to establish campaign debt and paying himself back. And, and uh, we always said that the money was used personally. So when the jury charge came up, the judge had to make the decision. You know, how do I charge this jury on all the facts? It could have been surplusage. It definitely was not prejudicial, and it definitely was a clear statement of the law. And the state clearly showed in rebuttal that the defendant owed no campaign debts. As a matter of fact, uh, in 1983, he said his campaign debts amounted to $183,000. He said that in a, certi in a certified financial statement. That was all the campaign debts he owed. Then, uh, in 1986, all of those debts were paid off. Mr. Fry testified to this. All of those debts were paid off. And the defendant out of the 1986 legitimate campaign account. Now, the 1986 legitimate campaign account to the tune of some $360,000 or $59,000 that he took out of the legitimate campaign account. This $200,000 was in addition. Thank you. Please the court. I'm Bill Clark, and George Beck and I represent Guy Hunt on this appeal. And I have to say to the court that being in these stone walls, the last time I heard a speech that long was when I was a cadet at West Point, and I heard General MacArthur speak uh, in one of the most memorable, memorable addresses that I think I've ever heard. General MacArthur, though, in that speech, reminded us as cadets of our obligations to the principles of duty, honor, country. And he said something that I think is important to us as we look and as you all look at this case. As he neared the end of his speech, he admonished us that if we failed, a million ghosts in olive drab and brown khaki and blue and gray would rise from their white crosses, thundering these magic words, duty, honor, country. Please the court, we as lawyers and judges have an obligation and a responsibility to our profession just as important as duty, honor, and country. Where are those principles found? They're found in the Bill of Rights. And as this court said in the case that the, the court wrote on the opinion relating to the denial of a public trial, no right ranks higher than the right of the accused to a fair trial. Now, if it pleads to the court, the denial of Guy Hunt's right to a fair trial is fundamental to every issue that is raised in this brief that George Beck argued today. Where do we begin? We begin with the indictment. Now, Ms. Davis has argued, I attempted to count, I think, nine different theories under which Guy Hunt allegedly violated this indictment. 
She begins by saying Guy Hunt was charged as the governor-elect. I invite you to read the indictment. Guy Hunt, while a public official, to wit, not governor-elect, to wit, the governor of the state of Alabama did use an official position. Much of what she's talked about, what they talk about in brief, is Guy Hunt as governor-elect. What was Guy Hunt charged with? Uh, George Beck is exactly right. How on earth was Guy Hunt or Guy Hunt's lawyer supposed to know when the state at this late date still is talking about a myriad of different theories under which that indictment is supposed to be uh, valid? The indictment uh, in particular, we've raised and the state ignored, and, and I, I would point out the state argued in its 307-page brief almost 100 pages of facts, and then in its argument another 72 pages of facts. The state, I submit, does not want to argue, and did not argue, the issues that are before this court. The indictment failed to allege knowingly and willfully. It was raised in the motion to dismiss. This court said in Chandler that it was not an issue there because it hadn't been raised. It was raised here. That issue is squarely before this court. And the issue, if it please the court, is not what the Attorney General says the indictment says. What did the grand jury say? Would they have returned an indictment that did not contend that Guy Hunt acted knowingly and willfully? W would they have done that if they had thought that he had to act knowingly and willfully? It's not alleged in the indictment. Can we presume that the grand jury intended that? It's not alleged in the indictment. The sufficiency of the evidence that the state argued at length, again, read the indictment. The suggestion of Ms. Davis that somebody had guilty knowledge, she says, here's an endorsement, endorsement, somebody did it. Who did it? This court knows that a person should not be convicted on suspicion or innuendo, certainly not the innuendo that was injected into this case by the Attorney General. There was no evidence that Guy Hunt was on the board of this nonprofit corporation. He was not on any of the bank accounts that were initially conceived into which monies went. There was no evidence that he had the authority to write any checks on those, that he made any decisions about where checks were supposed to go. Uh, the state talks about diversion of monies. There's absolutely no evidence that Guy Hunt participated whatsoever in any diversion of any monies, that he participated in any of the committees that planned where money was going to go. We would invite the court to look at the lack of evidence on the question of the sufficiency of the evidence. There was little mention made of the sequestration issue, and I only want to say one thing. Normally in a jury sequestration issue that comes before this court, it's where a juror has initiated some uh, violation of the sequestration order. That's not the case here. Why is that significant? It's significant because it's another example of Guy Hunt being denied a fair trial. We have a judge who made the decision without telling either side, you can talk to your family members on the telephone during the course of the trial. You can talk to your ministers. Now the state would has made in the past some light of that, that, well, why would a minister be objecting to talking to your ministers? We're talking about in the midst of a trial in a highly charged case where it is unclear what the defendant is charged with. The slightest word from a minister or family member could very well have triggered a juror to make some decision that was contrary and not based on the evidence. And a timely motion for mistrial was made during the course of the trial. Before you leave that uh, particular point, uh, yes, sir. The, uh, the uh, judge, uh, uh, the judge uh, in uh, permitting these people uh, to talk to a minister, uh, there's nothing in the record to show what they talked about. No, sir. It, it and you're asking us in your, in your brief uh, to presume prejudice. It was stipulated that the hearing on the motion for new trial and the motion for judgment of acquittal, that the contacts occurred, that the judge almost directed uh, that ministers could come to the rooms. But you say that there was a presumption of prejudice. 
presumption of prejudice under these circumstances. Yes, sir. But you cite no cases in your brief uh, to support that. Well, I think in the, in the case of Troja, where there was a minister who talked with uh, one of the jurors, it was a relative. Now, in that case, there was some evidence of, of what was said, but I think if it pleased the court, in the context of this case, where this is not an inadvertent contact, this is a directed contact, where a judge says that a sequestration, uh, that sequestration can be violated. And the purpose of sequestration, when it's done, is to try and preclude a juror from having some extraneous contact, getting some extraneous information that may influence him. Uh, we rely on the case, the Troy case, the Supreme Court decision, and, and I acknowledge that in that case there was some evidence of, of what was said. But I think the unusual facts of this case bring it within the overall scope of that case that there should be a presumption of prejudice that shifted the burden to the state to show that there was no prejudice at that time, and they chose not to do anything. Please, the court, the state has suggested that the trial judge didn't know the law before the case or during the pretrial proceedings. I would hope that we did not have a trial judge of this state who was trying a case of this magnitude and didn't know the law and hadn't even looked at the law, as the state would now suggest. If I were the judge, I think I'd resent that suggestion. But what do we know, at least that one thing this judge did, two weeks before the trial, during the course of pretrial, he contacted, the state wants to call it inadvertent, it could have been an inadvertent meeting, but the questions that were asked after weren't inadvertent. He asked his friend and the former chairman of the State Ethics Commission, what's the law with regard to the use of excess campaign funds for personal use. Now, the state says, well, that wasn't even an issue. Why was the trial judge asking the question if he didn't think it were an issue? And what was the answer? He was told use of excess campaign funds for personal use is permissible. If one reads the statutes as one would normally expect one would do, that is, read the Ethics Act, which was passed first, and then read the Fair Campaign Practices Act, which says that any other lawful purpose is permissible. Now, the state wants to switch that and say, read the Fair Campaign Practices Act first and then read the Ethics Act. That's backwards from the normal construction of statutes. But the contacts that, that Judge Thomas made, I, I think the court, if the court will look, the issue is not that just that this was a contact. It's who it was with. This wasn't just a political figure. This is the former chairman of the State Ethics Commission that referred this case to the grand jury. In one of the cases we cited in our brief, State versus Romano, a Washington case, the court quoted from its Judicial Ethics Act and stated the prescription against communications concerning a proceeding includes communications from lawyers, law teachers, and others not participating in the proceeding. What do they suggest a judge do if he wants some advice on the law? Request an amicus brief. Not go out and ask the former director of the Ethics Commission, not call the Ethics Commission, as Judge Thomas did, and say, you got any jury charges? Or is it, uh, Anderson apparently recalls that he thinks somebody from uh, Judge Thomas's office may have called his office. It is, concerned, it is of concern to us, if it please the court, that Judge Thomas made these contacts. They were discovered. The issue was raised. He allowed jurors to make contacts outside the, their own uh, number. Apparently, Judge Thomas believed that such contacts are permissible for jurors and for himself. He refused to testify. The state says, well, he wasn't a material witness because somebody else could testify. How do we know that a judge who believed that such contacts by himself were permissible didn't contact somebody else? How do we know that this change in his position didn't result when he called somebody else other than James Anderson, whose position didn't agree with his ultimate position? That's one of the purposes for not allowing such contacts because if it goes on, 
This court and the public has no way of knowing whether that judge is deciding the law based on his view or some witness who the defendant doesn't have a right to cross-examination, cross-examine. Now, the statute of limitations, I think the court has the, the issue, but I do want to, to, to ask uh, somewhat of a rhetorical question. The state says it's diversion. If it is diversion under the Ethics Act, why isn't the offense complete at the time of the diversion? Not sometime later when the money's spent. And if it's the diversion, and if one looks at the, the cases that have been decided under the Ethics Act, those cases that deal with conflicts of interest, and they all deal with conflicts of interest, the focus is on when was the conflict of interest. Well, if the state's position is it's when there was a diversion of funds, that's when the statute would have started to run. But on the other hand, the state says, well, that's not when the statute starts to run. The statute starts to run only when the money's spent. And perhaps Ms. Davis and I uh, read Britton and Rampey and Chandler differently. I don't think there's such a, a drastic difference in how the court uh, interpret the Ethics Act in those cases. I think the court was consistent. When dirt comes into your yard, uh, and you've got control of them, it's your dirt. You violated the Ethics Act, as in Britain or in Rampey. When lumber comes into your possession and it's being paid for out of uh, the Glencoe cities or Glencoe communities' funds, you violated the Ethics Act. Chandler, in that case, this court said when Mayor Chandler received $50,000, the act was violated. And went on to say that it was also violated when the property was sold because he got a gain from the tax advantage. How much clearer could the law be that it is the time that the individual has control? And, and Ms. Davis wants to argue that there were two accounts Go back and read, as George suggested, the testimony of Banker Clark, who's no relation, who said very clearly that on November the 12th, 1988, there was one account under the control of Guy Hunt and that he owned the account. He was the only authorized signatory on that account. Under the state's theory, a person, a public official could put money into a, a, a personal account let it sit there for life, and then he dies, and then his children could get it, and I guess there'd be no violation because he'd never have spent it. Is that the message that this court wants to convey to public officials? It's only when it's spent, not when it comes into a, a personal account? Because we deny that there's any offense at all. The position taken by Guy Hunt throughout that there was no use of personal funds, no use of campaign funds for personal use, but that these were reimbursement for campaign debts. But taking the state's argument on its face, we submit that if there was an offense, it occurred at the time that money was transferred into the account, so the account changed, so that it become, became solely Guy Hunt's account, and that was November 12, 1988. More than three years later, there was an indictment, and the statute had run. The jury charge, the state says this case is not about campaign funds. Well, if it's not about campaign funds, then why was there so much discussion about campaign funds in the pretrial? Why was the judge asking others about what is the law? If there was, if the case is not about campaign funds, why then was not the court's charge error? in that it was terribly confusing if the case is not about campaign funds. Why would the court not instead charge the Fair Campaign Practices Act does not apply to this case? This case is not about the use of campaign funds. But instead, the court charged very directly that it's against the law to use excess campaign funds for personal use. 
and the defense objected specifically to that charge. I don't understand the ambivalence which, which the state takes on that issue other than I think the state recognizes the problem, the very serious problem with that charge. And the court need only look at the statement of the chairman of the Ethics Commission, the Attorney General's permit, uh, position, the uh, former chairman of the State Ethics Commission, and the own court's view up until a point to see, as Judge Thomas said at one point, everybody agrees excess campaign funds can be used for personal use. The state in its brief, 307 page brief, and I, I didn't count all the cases, did not even respond to Ex parte Alexander, the Supreme Court decision that recognizes clearly that when a court enlarges the scope of a statute so as to cover some conduct that has not previously been covered, it is in effect a judicial ex post facto law, and that is precisely what Judge Thomas did here. There had not been any law, and, and, and the state says the Attorney General had always taken the position that, that was against the law. Look at the, the colloquy cited in the brief when Mr. Beck said something about uh, there had been no decisions, and the Attorney General says the issue had not been decided. And the state in its brief wants to say, well, he was talking about there weren't any cases decided. The issue had not been decided. Please, the court, this case, it, 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 as you read the brief, from the opening statements to the selection of the jury to the final argument, was filled with innuendo, filled with suggestions intentionally put into this case by the Attorney General to prejudice the jury against Guy Hunt. George talked about the cumulative effect. Two of the Attorney General's comments in closing argument vividly demonstrate, I think, the, the prejudice that were injected into this case. What on earth did a statement of this sort have to do with this case? The power of the governor to pardon criminals condemned to the death penalty. That was objected to. What, what did that have to do with this case? What was the Attorney General trying to do? He was trying to suggest that Guy Hunt was light on crime, I guess. And then he goes on to say that Guy Hunt ignored the education needs of the people. Was he trying to suggest that somehow monies that had been raised were supposed to go for the education needs of the people and they weren't? Each of the issues raised we would submit is sufficient for this court to reverse Guy Hunt's conviction and to render a judgment in his, in his favor. But when one combines all of those issues, Plus the other issues that we cited in the brief uh, on the question of cumulative error. We would submit that there is clearly reversible error. General MacArthur in the speech that I mentioned challenged the soldier to focus on preparation of war and suggested that the res resolution of important civil issues should be left to others. And one of those he said that should be left to others is a preservation of our individual rights. Now we are those others that General MacArthur was referring to. A guy Hunt was denied a fair and impartial trial. He's entitled to have his conviction reversed, not because he was the governor, not because he was a preacher or a farmer, He's entitled to have it reversed because it is the right thing to do under the law. And we would submit that Guy Hunt is entitled to have his conviction reversed and a judgment to be rendered in his favor. Thank you. Both sides were obviously very well prepared and arguments very well presented. It is time for stand and recess. On December 13, 1993, the Alabama Criminal Court of Appeals decided to affirm the lower court ruling that former Governor Hunt was guilty of using his office for direct personal financial gain. Last week, on January 25th, 
the former governor filed an application for his case to be heard by the Alabama State Supreme Court. The court's decision to hear the case is discretionary, and it has not determined that the case will be accepted. This week in the judiciary, Rosemary Barkett, Chief Justice of the Florida Supreme Court, was nominated by President Bill Clinton for the Federal Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. Her confirmation hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee began Thursday. And Deval Patrick, a Boston attorney, was nominated by the President to head the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division. He would fill the spot left vacant for months after the withdrawal of nominee Lonnie Guineer. And that's our program for this week. America and the Courts is C-SPAN's weekly look at the Supreme Court and legal issues. The program is first run every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, 4 p.m. Pacific Time.